Welcome everyone to the webinar today. The topic of the talk is about the uh, APIs from Google and Orchid and how to combine them. The speakers for this talk is uh, Liz uh, Krisnarich from Orchid. Uh, Liz is part of the Orchid technical team. Uh, she is one of the people who is working on the interface design and development of Orchid. In addition, Liz is also involved in automation of Orchid services and training technologies uh, in the Orchid ecosystem. Uh, I met Liz initially in Open Repository Conference when she was giving a talk about Orchid API. At that time, we thought, okay, well, this is a this can make a very good webinar, and that's why we are here. So, with that introduction, uh, Liz, I'm handing this to you. All right, great. Thanks so much, Amir. Um, I am happy to be here uh, today to do this uh, ANS webinar. And as Amir mentioned, today we're talking all about APIs. So, particularly about uh, Google APIs and ORCID APIs, but there's some topics that will sort of apply generally. And so as Amir mentioned, I am a developer at ORCID, which means uh, that, that my work kind of revolves around APIs. So the technical team at ORCID, uh, most of the work that we do uh, is involved in building APIs, but I also do a lot of, of work with internal applications at ORCID, so things that support our, uh, our internal development and and operations. So a lot of what I do uh, is about getting all of our different systems uh, to talk to each other so that we can automate some of our tasks and make everybody's life more efficient and more convenient. And that involves using a lot of APIs. So I do work on building APIs and on using them. And through that experience, I, I think I have a, a few tips and tricks that I can uh, hopefully share with you today. So we'll get started with a little with a little background. So I know everybody has uh, sort of different perspectives and maybe different technical levels. So we'll sort of ground it in some basic uh, some basic discussion about APIs. Um, so we've got all sorts of things up in the up in the cloud these days. So we've got things like photos and documents, data, and applications running uh, in the cloud that we can access at any time from from any computer. Um, this is fabulous. So we can uh, we can get that data and run those applications and, and do um, all sorts of great different things. But sometimes there is not just one single uh, data source or one application that does everything that we want. Um, in order to to do something very specific, you might need data or features from multiple different sources and applications. So that's where APIs come in. So there are loads of APIs out there uh, for lots of different popular applications. Facebook, Dropbox, Amazon, Slack, Google Drive, all sorts of uh, applications that we can uh, combine in different ways to, uh, to do lots of different things. So that's what we'll be focused on today, so the idea of combining these uh, applications to get exactly the functionality that we want. But first, um, we'll start out with what is an API? Uh, so we hear that term tossed around a lot. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. What it really means is a set of rules that allows computer applications to talk to each other. Um, and that those sets of rules aren't really universal. There's no sort of governing body that, that defines exactly how an API has to work. Really, software developers who develop applications get to decide how the API for their application gets to work. There are some common sorts of uh, sorts of architectures that lots of software developers use, but they all behave a little bit differently and have sort of subtle nuances to them, little quirks that make uh, using multiple APIs together kind of a challenge. So that said, why would you use an API? Uh, so in most cases, APIs allow you to do the same sorts of things that you can do in an application. Uh, user interface, but just a little bit more. So for example, uh, in the Google Drive API, you can do things like create a new document. Uh, or in the Google Drive interface, you can create a new document. You can do the same thing uh, in the API, but you have a little bit more control over the behavior. Also, um, you can do things faster and you can automate uh, repetitive tasks. So if you need to create 900 uh, Google Drive documents, you certainly don't want to sit there and do that by, by hand in the user interface. You can use the API to automate that a little bit. And finally, what we're focused on here today is 
uh, the fact that when you start using APIs, you can combine data and functionality from all sorts of different applications uh, into your own custom application, and maybe even combine it with some functionality and some data that you have um, in your own organization's application to come up with exactly uh, the right thing that you need. So in this session, uh, as I mentioned, we'll talk about a couple of different uh, APIs that I've been working with uh, quite a bit to automate some of uh, the internal reporting that we do at ORCID. Uh, so we'll be talking about the Google Analytics API, the Google Drive API, Google Sheets, as well as the ORCID APIs. And the sort of project that this is built around is creating a, a custom analytics report that's uploaded to Google Drive as a spreadsheet and then combined with some data uh, that we pull in from the ORCID API. So before we dive into those, um, in case anybody's not too familiar with these tools, uh, first of all, Google Analytics um, is a really popular and free to a certain extent uh, tool that allows you to track user behavior on a website that you own. So things like how many users are visiting your site, what pages are they looking at, um, what country are they coming from, and you can customize that even more to get more granular uh, information about what people are, are doing on your website. Next up, Google Drive. Uh, so that's a pretty popular, common uh, cloud file storage and sharing application from Google. And uh, living within that is the Google uh, Sheets application, which is basically Excel living in Google Drive. And finally, we have ORCID. Uh, so if anybody is not familiar with, with ORCID, so at ORCID we run a system um, of persistent identifiers for uh, academic researchers. Um, and we also uh, allow them to create a digital record of their scholarly contributions, so things like publications that they've, that they've authored, affiliations, uh, more recently uh, peer review service that they've done, and all sorts of other uh, aspects of their scholarly record. So working with those, uh, that handful of different APIs, uh, the, the steps that we'll be going over in this session is uh, or are uh, querying the analytics API, um, setting up Google API credentials, um, getting analytics data from the API and uploading it to Google Drive as a spreadsheet, uh, then setting up ORCID API credentials and getting some data from the ORCID API and adding it to Drive. Um, so I know this is this is kind of a specific application that seems to focus around analytics and um, and ORCID, but really once we get into the to the Google API and setting up setting up credentials, particularly those aspects are are applicable to almost all of the the Google APIs. So um, there's kind of something in there for uh, for a lot of different use cases. And I should mention, um, I did post the, the link in the chat box, but I have the materials for this entire uh, session, including the, the slides and some code samples and a whole lot of, of instruction on, on setting up and using the, the code samples in, uh, in GitHub. So if you want to check that out, follow along, or just look at that later, it's all uh, right there in GitHub for you. All right. So, uh, we're going to start out uh, looking at the Google Analytics API, and using the Analytics API is sort of sort of assumes that uh, that you have a few prerequisites. Uh, the first one being, uh, since the Analytics API is all about tracking user behavior on a website, uh, the, the first prerequisite is that you have a website. So for the sake of this demonstration, I have a little sample website. Mine is a sample institutional repository that uh, in theory allows users to uh, to download publications from the site and for some reason my download buttons have recently disappeared. But that's the site. There's a link to it in the in in GitHub. Um, so we have a site. Next prerequisite for working with Google Analytics API is that you have set up a Google Analytics account um, and configured your website within that account. So this part I'm not going to walk through step by step because we're more so concerned with, with getting into the APIs, but the, the link and some resources for getting that set up are, uh, are in the slides and in the, in the GitHub documents. So finally, 
Um, so you can get some basic information about who's visiting your, your site and what they're looking at with just a, a basic Google Analytics setup without doing any further customization. Um, but depending on, on your site, you might want to set up some custom, custom tracking. So uh, in my case, I, uh, for my repository site, I want to know uh, which items users are downloading. So I have in advance set up some tracking on the on the download links for my uh, for my publications on my website and that tracking uh, I set up through a tool called uh, the Google Tag Manager which is kind of a new Google tool that allows you to set up customized tracking uh, in, a, in a user interface um, rather than just straight in code so it makes it a little bit a little bit easier so assuming we have those things in place we can then dive into the the analytics API and in in sort of a perpetual parade of, of handy tools that um, that Google offers um, when you start querying the API it's really handy to use um, to use this tool the API the analytics query Explorer so what this does is allow you to sort of build queries visually and um, and see what the data that you get back from these queries uh, is without having to commit them to code and run it. So it just uh, makes it simple to sort of play around with the API. So once you open up the Query Explorer, you'll be prompted to, to sign in to your Google account and it will automatically uh, pull in your uh, any Google Analytics sites or any sites that are set up with Google Analytics um, into this section. So you don't even have to know anything about your account or or the website property ID. You can just get right into the queries. So uh, looking at the analytics queries, so what we're looking at here is basically um, the API version of what you might see in the uh, in the analytics dashboard. So the dashboard looks like this. It's kind of a pretty uh, pretty user interface to the analytics um, analytics data. But you're kind of limited to what Google provides you with here. And it lives within the analytics uh, API dashboard. So you can download reports, but you can't really mix up the data with other, uh, with other data to create anything, anything custom. So if we flip over to the Query Explorer, we can pull out some of the same data that we see in that user interface, but just in, uh, in text. So we can really customize the, the queries to get exactly what we want. Um, so some of the aspects that you can customize here, of course, are the start and end dates for your, uh, for your report. And then we get into a couple of, of other um, pieces, metrics and dimensions. Um, so in Google Analytics, uh, there are many, many uh, dimensions and metrics that you can, uh, that you can get data on. Um, and what a dimension is, is how you want to break down the, the analytics data. So do you want something like users by the city that they're located in, by the device that they're accessing? So it's kind of the buckets of, of data that you want. Um, metrics, on the other hand, are the things that you're counting. So whether it's clicks or page views uh, or something else entirely, it's what you're counting. So, um, so you're putting the metrics into your dimensions. Uh, buckets. Um, those are the kind of the two key components of the of the analytics API, and there is a huge reference to um, to those called the Dimensions and Metrics Explorer. That's le that lets you um, look through all of the different uh, dimensions and metrics and see what they mean. Um, that's sort of helpful to have to flip back and forth between the Explorer and the the Dimensions and Metrics Explorer and the Query Explorer to get what you uh, exactly what you want. Finally, the other really handy field uh, that's available is filters. So we don't necessarily want um, all of the all of the information from the Dimensions and Metrics. We might want to know um, something about users who only visited our homepage or something something like that. So we can use filters to uh, get just the data that we just the subset of data that we want. So for my site, I've got this query uh, sort of set up. My metric is total events, so total sort of user interactions with my site. 
Uh, and then the dimension that I want is event label. And this is uh, specific to some of the custom uh, tracking that I've set up. So some of my uh, some of my events, events being clicks and downloads, have um, have tracking attached to them that will tell me what the uh, DOI of the item that was clicked or downloaded is. Um, and filters, in this case, I only want to know, uh, I only want information about uh, things that users have downloaded. So there are plenty of other fields that you can set here, but I'm going to focus on dimensions, metrics, and filters because those are kind of the big, the big key pieces. I can run my query right in this window, and what I get back is not only the query results, uh, but a link to the report that I can go back to. And most importantly for, um, for developers, you get the full query URI. So when you go to, um, to code something, something up using this query, you have all the bits and pieces that you need. Uh, right there that you can drop into your code. All right, so we've got our analytics query uh, query ready to go. Uh, now we need to get access to the Google APIs to start uh, to start writing up something that can uh, take that query and and run it against the the APIs. All right, so so next up we need to get access to the Google APIs, um, and this is where for for me getting started things started to get a little bit. Uh, tricky because there are just a lot of steps to steps to go through that are not completely obvious at all stages. Um, so to access Google APIs, you need um, a, a set of credentials, so something sort of like a username and password uh, for the for the API. Um, since Google and most other API providers, de depending on the provider, don't uh, necessarily let anyone in off the street interact with their API, they have to know something about uh, who you are and what you're doing before you can get into the to the API. So for Google APIs, uh, to get access to any of the of the APIs, you need to create Google Developer account and a Google Developer uh, project. So we'll flip over to Google. So this is just another sort of of Google account that you can connect to. You can log right in with your existing. Uh, Google account and what you'll need to do first uh, is create a project. So uh, when you first set up Google developers, you'll be prompted to create a project uh, right away. Otherwise, if you have an existing account, you can go up uh, to the top menu and uh, click on create project. Uh, the URL, by the way, up here is console.developers.google.com. You can also get there through just developers.google.com. Um, and what a project is, is really just sort of a bucket to put your API credentials uh, into. It doesn't necessarily have to be related to a specific coding project. Um, it is useful for keeping credentials uh, separate and sharing them, uh, sharing them with different groups of, of users. Um, for example, at ORCID we pretty much use one, uh, one Google Developers project to store all of our, all of our Google, Google Apps credentials. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new project, and this time sometimes takes a few seconds depending on how fast the Google APIs are running. So you can see that still spinning up in the upper right-hand corner. So once we get set that set up, the next step will be to uh, enable different Google APIs for that project. Um, there are hundreds of Google APIs, and they don't all come pre-enabled when you set up a new project. You do have to add them one by one. So once your project is set up, you'll automatically be uh, shipped over to the section where you can add APIs. The first one that we want to add is the analytics API. So great, we'll click enable. And so just as Google uh, says, this API is enabled, but we don't actually have uh, credentials for it, so we can't use it yet. So the next step is to click this button and add some credentials. So at this point, uh, when we're talking about Credentials. This is this is again sort of that that username and password concept to access the API. And Google has a few different types of credentials that you can uh, get for different APIs depending on the type of project that you're working on. And this is where uh, things can get a little bit tricky. If you are a developer, you might be familiar with um, with OAuth authorization protocols, and that's what Google uses for its APIs. Um, and there are a few different 
uh, a few different types of OAuth authorization protocols. Some of them require a user uh, interaction and uh, some of them don't. So it depends if you have uh, an application that you want to be able to run all by itself uh, on a server um, or on well any machine without uh, without somebody having to uh, type in a username and password or, or do something that involves a browser and a user interface every time you want to run the application, uh, then you need to set up access through uh, what's called a service account. So these other these other options, um, particularly the API key, require some sort of user interaction. So we're going to focus on the service account authorization today because it's kind of the trickiest and also uh, really useful because we can set up uh, an application or a script that uh, we can set to maybe run automatically every so often uh, without anybody uh, having to touch it or interact with it. Um, so this little uh, widget is designed to sort of tell you what kind of credentials you need, but uh, but I know that we already need a service account. So I'm going to click service account. And what a service account is, is kind of a shadow user uh, in Google that can do things with the with the API, but it's not really a person. It doesn't have all of the, uh, the same privileges that a person does, but it can access different Google API resources um, on on behalf of an application. So I'm going to create a new service account. For the sake of this demo, I'm going to make it a project owner so it can have all sorts of access to do all sorts of different things. Um, permissions that you want may vary depending on your project. So here's our service account ID that, uh, that we'll need for later. We also want uh, a new private key. So this is a file that um, that will download and we'll use that sort of in lieu of a password. So this will be basically our password for the for the API. And I'm going to make this uh, P12 format. Depending on what you're uh, what you're doing, especially if you're working with um, with Google Apps for Business, where you have your own domain, you might also want to um, enable Google Apps uh, domain wide. Uh, this allows your service account user or gives your service account user access to to everything on the on the Google Apps domain um, on the API side. It doesn't automatically give them sharing permissions for those things, but it allows them to or it allows the service account to access those things through the API if sharing uh, permission is granted. So I'm going to enable that, and for the sake related to some of the other OAuth. Uh, authorization flows, you do need to enter a product name, even though it might not be useful for your particular use case. So we'll create that, and it's uh, prompting us to download this P12 uh, key file, which is that thing that will act as our sort of as our password in our code later. All right, so that's all that's all set to go. Uh, so we've got analytics enabled. The other um, the other app that we're going to need access to is Google Drive, and we can go ahead and activate that at the same time. So this process is pretty much the same for all of the different Google APIs. So I'm going to go back to the library and pick out Drive API, enable that. And now since we have that service account already configured, we don't need to um, go back and configure credentials again for that. It's just enabled and, uh, and it's set to go. Now the other one that we need is the Sheets API. So that's set to go as well. So when we're working with the, the analytics API, the one last thing that you also need to do is add your service account user uh, to your uh, analytics account. So that's one, one step that can kind of trip you up. And so that's under user management in your, uh, in your analytics administration. So you just add that person like any other user using the, um, the kind of fake email address, the user ID that was generated when you set up your uh, service account. Finally, to get ready for using, um, using Google Drive, we'll need to create a folder and give our service account access to it. So I've actually already done that in, in Drive, but the, the reason being, so we want to create sort of a custom report from analytics and drop it into a Google Drive folder. Um, and it's a little easier if we already have that uh, Drive folder set up and also also shared with that that service account. 
All right, so all the parts and pieces are set to go. That's a pretty tedious set of steps, and I have them listed all in the all in the GitHub documentation. But now it's sort of sort of time to time to get into some coding, or at least talk about what we can uh, do with all of that set up. So before we go on, are there any questions about uh, configuring access to Google APIs? Well, Liz, I have one question. Uh, we sure. we talked about creating the Google account for a uh, Google Developer account for Google Services. So uh, I know some of the Google APIs are uh, are not free, like the Google uh, Cloud Services, for example. You need to pay for it if you use beyond certain uh, units units of computation. Mm -hmm. So if, for the APIs that we are using in this presentation, would it be correct to say all of them are free API? All of the ones we're using in this presentation are free APIs. Yes. Um, certainly, when you there are um, when when you get into higher volume usage of the analytics API, there is a paid version of the um, of the analytics API or an upgrade. But the ones that we are that we're talking about uh, today at a basic level are free. All right, so we're all set up, and we can finally uh, get back to uh, writing those queries and getting analytics data and uploading it into into Drive. So the code examples that uh, that I'm going to use uh, use Python, but the but all of these things certainly can be done in um, in any different any language that you prefer to use. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that Google has uh, has libraries for uh, for quite a few languages. So this is the Google Analytics uh, documentation. Um, all of the other APIs have documentation that's formatted similarly, and most of them have uh, have pretty robust client libraries that that make uh, interacting with the APIs really uh, really easy. So that's the first thing that you're going to want to uh, get started with. And if you do look at the the code samples, uh, you can see that we uh, import the OAuth two clients and the the Google API client right off the bat. So with those with those client libraries uh, now. Uh, available and up and running. The next step is to authenticate to the APIs that you that you want to use. So this is where that um, that P12 uh, client secret file comes in um, when you're using a service account, at least. And the type of OAuth two authorization. So for those of you who are who may have heard of OAuth uh, before or familiar with with authorization protocols, uh, the type that we're using that's kind of the important keyword to look up if you're if you're searching Stack Overflow or uh, or just Googling for uh, for help is signed J JWT assertion credentials. It's kind of a less common uh, OAuth two authorization flow, and there's not a lot of information on the Google the Google websites about it. There's kind of an overview document that describes the whole process, but that was that was definitely a tricky piece to um, to figure out. So I definitely recommend um, either taking a look at, at this code sample or um, or doing some searching for signed JWT assertion credential authorization if you have any trouble uh, getting the authorization piece done. But in on the Python side, right over here, this is where we're doing the uh, the authorization. So using uh, using the Google API client libraries, we are sending in our some information about our service account, our key, and the API that we're looking to uh, to authorize into. So that piece works the same for all of the APIs that that we're working with. So it's a piece of code that you can that you can reuse across an application. So next up, getting back to those uh, queries that we looked at in the Query Explorer over here, um, we can now take that those bits of that query and put it into, into code. So if we look at the, the URL, uh, we've got our, um, our metrics, dimensions, and filters that we need to send into the Google API um, all, all right down here. And right here is where, that, where, the, where those pieces get sent in. So there's it, within the Google client library for, uh, for the API, for the analytics API, uh, we've got some I've got some methods we can just send that data right into and run those run those queries. So finally, um, uploading data to Google Drive. So we do the authentication the same the, the same way as, as analytics. 
but instead of sending in our query information, we send in some some file metadata and that go back over in the in the query here. When we got that uh, when we got that query data back, I put it into basically into a CSV file in memory, and then we're passing that over uh, as the uh, as the data for the the Google Drive file. So in in the part of my uh, part of my code that actually controls all of the the scripts at this point, if I comment out the uh, the Orchid API components and and run the script, should get back a file that has some bare analytics data in it. There we go. So it's got the date that I just ran it on. So this is what we have. So it's not a terribly fancy file, but um, but we've got our data out of out of analytics, and we can see some of the same uh, bits and pieces that we saw in the query explorer. Also, I have some some headers that I added in the in the script itself. Uh, so we've got all that into into a CSV and uploaded into Google Drive. And uh, the nice part about this is once you've got it in Google Drive, you could share it uh, with all uh, with any users you want, um, and also allow other users or other applications to make changes to it. And that's what we're going to do next. So I have some sort of blank spaces in here, so I can see how many uh, how many users have downloaded some of my DOIs. But uh, in this case, I want to know how many of those digital object identifiers are connected to Orchid records. Um, so I've got some space in here to add that that information. And next up, we're going to query the Orchid APIs and then use the Sheets API to uh, to edit this existing spreadsheet. So we're going to switch directions a little bit and talk about the ORCID API. So again, if you're not too familiar with ORCID, I'll flip over to the ORCID, the ORCID website. So again, uh, this is a digital identifier for researchers that can be linked to uh, publications and, uh, and funding and um, peer review activities and, and a few other types of activities to, uh, to help attribute those um, scholarly contributions to the right person. Since lots of people have the same or similar uh, names, it's uh, really helpful to have a unique digital identifier linked to those individuals instead of just trying to uh, connect those items to, uh, to names or to uh, sort of internal identifiers that don't, uh, don't cross-communicate well with other, other systems. Uh, so the whole ORCID identifier also also includes the concept of an ORCID record, so we have this uh, visual representation of, of a researcher's activities here in the ORCID record. There's a public version as well. So this is what you would see in the in the website user interface, but you can also get at um, all of this publicly visible data through our, uh, our APIs. Um, so we offer two different APIs. One is public, it's freely available, that's the one we're going to be uh, taking a look at today. So that allows you to uh, search and retrieve all of the information that's publicly visible in the in the ORCID uh, system. So the things that you can see uh, on the website, you can also get uh, get through the, through the APIs. Um, and another feature is that it allows you to get authenticated ORCID IDs from users, which is not a part we're gonna be talking about uh, at the moment. Uh, but it is there. Uh, we also have a paid member API that also allows um, member organizations to uh, to write data into the system and um, also includes a few other other features. Um, but we're focused on free APIs today, so we'll talk about getting access to the public API. Um, so like the Google APIs, we also require users to uh, to generate, to use credentials when they access the API. So we have um, a little bit of information, a little bit of control over how the API is being used. And so to do that, um, you first need to create an ORCID account. Uh, so create an ORCID identifier, and it doesn't matter if you're not, uh, not actually a researcher, it's perfectly fine to create an ORCID account. Um, so to do that, you can just go to the ORCID website and click any of the of the many uh, register for an ORCID ID links that we uh, that we have. All that you need to uh, to give us is a name and an email address, and then you'll be set up with your with your ORCID account. Once you sign into your account, 
you'll see at the top of the screen uh, that you have this developer tools tab. And that's the spot where you can go to create some API credentials. Um, flip back to the presentation since I've already created some in that account. So if you haven't uh, created credentials yet, you'll see a big blue button that says register for the Orchid Public API. Once you click that, you'll see a screen that prompts you to type in some information about your public API application, and that doesn't necessarily need to be too specific for the for just searching the API. And once you save that, you'll get um, a set of credentials that consists of a client ID and a client secret, so kind of like a username and password. So those are the two pieces that you'll need to um, to get information from the APIs. So once you have those things, uh, you can use those to query and to get uh, authenticated IDs. And in the next steps, we are going to, uh, to use those credentials to ask the ORCID API about uh, which ORCID IDs are connected to the DOIs that we're tracking uh, in analytics. So to get that information, there are kind of there are two steps in the API. And I'm going to show those using uh, just some, some basic uh, HTTP requests, um, which can be, uh, can be run in basically any, any programming language. Um, so for those of you who aren't quite sure what that means, so HTTP requests, that's sort of the same uh, as what you do when you, uh, when you visit a website in a browser, only uh, when you're using a sort of a terminal application like curl, uh, you can do uh, quite a few more things with HTTP requests than you can do with just a, a browser URL bar. All right, so first up, we need to use that client ID and client secret to get an access token. So the access token is what really allows you to, uh, to run your queries. So you need to send that token, which is a big long string of, of letters and numbers uh, that you'll send along with the, with the query. And in this case, uh, we need to send in some information uh, about the scope, so what we're looking to do with the APIs, as well as the environment that we're working with. So once we get that token, we can use it to run some queries on the ORCID API. And we do have uh, quite a bit of documentation on searching, so lots of different uh, parts and pieces of, of users' ORCID records that you can search. So we have keyword searching and fielded searching as well. So for this case, we're focused on searching for digital object identifiers. Uh, that query looks, uh, looks like this here on that line. When we translate it over into, into Python, and this is this orchidapi.py file, the query section uh, looks like this. So we're just sending a curl statement with that same query string. And in this case, we are taking a, that list of DOIs uh, from analytics and just repeating that query uh, over and over again for those DOIs. And finally, as I mentioned, we're going to edit the existing spreadsheet to, to add the ORCID data in. Um, so when you're using the, the Sheets API, so when I put together this presentation, the, the newest version of the Sheets API hadn't yet been released, and now it, now it has. Um, so previously, it was pretty common, especially in Python, to use uh, another library on top of the Sheets API, um, because the Sheets API is, is a little finicky. It doesn't have a lot of the features that, um, that are sort of needed to make it really useful. Um, so I'm using the Python gspread library, which just makes it easier to do things like search for data in an existing spreadsheet and update, uh, update cells in a spreadsheet in a batch. Um, since the newer version of the, of the Google Sheets API has been released, there are um, quite a few more features. It still doesn't have the um, have searching built in, so gspread is still still useful in certain cases. So what we're doing in the uh, with the Sheets API portion of this code is uh, getting the drive file ID of that of that file that uh, that we created. So every Google Docs file you'll see at the end of the in the URL string has a file ID, so that's the important part that you need in order to be able to manipulate the file. In fact, folders have IDs uh, as well, and you use those in the in the API to find the find the right folder and list of files inside. Um, and then in this code, all that we're doing is looking for 
uh, for the cells that contain the DOIs that we're looking for and dropping those uh, pieces of information from the ORCID uh, from the ORCID API in next to them. So if I uncomment the ORCID bits in my in my report script and run it again, we should see those things drop in. And this will take a few more minutes because um, the Sheets API is kind of slow and and also we're querying ORCID as, as well. So we're adding a few more steps to the process. So while that's running, uh, we can talk about just a few more things that you can do once you have that data in uh, into something like a Google spreadsheet. Um, so we've got, in addition to just the, the plain Sheets API, you can add in um, charts from the Google Charts API. And Google also has sort of a JavaScript-like uh, language that lets you do some, some formatting. So you can add um, fonts and colors and make your sheets look a bit prettier. Of course, you could also pull that, uh, the data from that sheet out using the Drive API and um, manipulate it with some other application. A couple of tips when you're using the, the Google APIs uh, that kind of tricked me a few times were that, um, so when you're using those P12 uh, files, you are actually, and authenticating to the Google APIs, you're actually generating a token in the process um, that's just passed around in your application. Um, unlike the, uh, the ORCID API tokens, which are valid uh, long term, so they're valid for 20 years, um, Google API tokens expire in an hour. Um, so if you're running code that loops through a, a, a lot of different files or folders or whatever, um, you just need to make sure that you uh, that you account for the fact that you need to have a, a valid token and your tokens will expire in an hour. Secondly, working with free APIs, so it's great that they're free, but it also comes with um, comes with the expectation that you might not always have perfect access to the APIs all the time. So Google APIs, particularly since they're popular, they can have a heavy load and that load can vary, they're a little bit twitchy. Um, you'll get some sporadic errors, just sort of unexplained uh, 500 errors, the service isn't available, um, sorts of things, and that's just part of part of working with free APIs, uh, especially when you're running uh, lots of queries over and over again, and particularly with the analytics API, uh, there are def query limits and rate limits that you can run up against um, if you're running lots of queries over and over again. Finally, as I mentioned, the Sheets API is pretty slow, so it's good to try to combine as many uh, actions into one request as possible. I think my script should be finished now, and it is. All right, and I can see that my ORCID API data was dropped in to those couple of spots where I had uh, placeholders for it. All right, so again, um, the code for this is all uh, all available in GitHub as well as the presentation and a whole lot of URLs for the for the resources. And I think uh, we can go ahead and maybe paste that URL into the chat box again. But at this point, I think we have a few minutes left for uh, for questions. Um, so I see there are a couple in the in the chat box. So uh, one is you could choose to store your resulting spreadsheet locally. Certainly that um, that is yeah that's definitely a possibility um, and not in Google Drive. Yep, definitely definitely possible. Um, but uh, for the sake of this demo, one of the one of the handy things. Um, of uploading it to Drive is that you can share it uh, with other people, either at your organization or or outside of it. Uh, sorry, Liz. So for the purpose of recording, uh, I just actually repeat that question, which the question was: uh, Can we actually store the spreadsheet or the result of the script into the local Drive rather than the Google Drive? Which you already answered. Um, right. Now the next question here is that uh, so the, I'm reading the actual question is. What languages does the, does the ORCID API support? Um, so our API is a uh, is a RESTful API. So it's uh, you interact with it using HTTP requests, and so it, with that in mind, you can interact with it with any language that um, that can send and send and receive HTTP requests. So we have some libraries out there for uh, for everything ranging from PHP to JavaScript to Java. Also Python, and we have a couple of people that are using uh, .NET uh, as well. But anything that you can think of that can can make HTTP requests, we do on our 
And so our support site is, our documentation site is members.orchid.org, and it doesn't mean that you actually need to be a member to, to access it, but there you'll find um, all of the documentation for our APIs, and we also have um, some example uh, example code and some libraries for different uh, for different languages. We, oh, we even have some uh, have a Go app, uh, Ruby, definitely. Okay, well, that is a comprehensive list. Well, we have one more question, uh, somehow actually related to the API. So the question is, I'm just reading the actual uh, question, and then I actually add something top of that. Uh, so the question is whether the ORCID API can be used to link publication funding uh, grants info into the authors, perhaps using the Crossref API. So if I understood the question here correctly, it's actually talking about a mashup of APIs using ORCID to actually find what publication or grants can be linked to that. So is there any function like this in uh, ORCID system? Um, so that would be, so finding which, um, which ORCID identifiers are linked to, to funding. Um, so we do have a funding section on on the ORCID record that either um, either users themselves can add funding items to or other member, other organizations outside of ORCID um, can actually populate funding information into users' ORCID records. Um, so you can you can get funding information out of the uh, out of the ORCID API and again just check the documentation. You can you can see um, where to get those things. Uh, there also, um, so there are some uh, some funding agencies that are that are putting uh, putting ORCID identifiers into into uh, their data. Um, Crossref, Fundref, some items have uh, have ORCID identifiers in them. Um, we have so Uber is the is one of the organizations that that we work with that also includes ORCID, uh, ORCID IDs or allows uh, allows agencies to populate ORCID IDs, and that's got a lot of federal funding information. That's not to say that all of those grants have ORCID identifiers populated uh, into them, but we are seeing more and more organizations that are adding uh, ORCID identifiers to their to their funding items and then populating them back into uh, to ORCID. Okay, uh, we I think let's just answer one more question because we are technically uh, sure. our time limit. Uh, so the last question is that what sort of uh, ways or methods uh, do you uh, do you use basically to cope with the API errors? Um, so that's a that's a really good question, particularly with uh, with Google APIs, since the errors can be really unpredictable and not you know not at all related to uh, to your code. So I have some. Uh, some pretty long running scripts in uh, a, that use Google APIs. At, I, to be honest, have some pretty blunt uh, workarounds. So one thing for the for the token check is um, I have in some of my scripts a sort of a time based uh, token check that starts a you know that checks the the current time when the token uh, when I get the token and then it uh, just checks routinely throughout the script um, to see if it's below the token expiration time, and if it's above a certain time, it just gets a new token automatically. Certainly, you could also check to see if the token uh, is valid, but because of weight limits and, and API errors, I like to keep that check on the um, on the script side, so I'm not using up my quota. In terms of handling just the, the random errors, I if I can't can't sort of monitor the the logging output as it's running, I'll sometimes just use a bash script to uh, to retry it uh, until it succeeds. That can present some errors if you're uh, if it's retrying because your your code is because there's something wrong with your code, you'll hit that uh, API rate limit really, really quickly as your code retries over and over again. But those are some of the things that that I've been doing. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. That was a great presentation. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming to this talk, uh, and I hope to see you in the next, uh, uh, next uh, webinar.